in pit lane brought to you by online invent and with thanks to our platinum star patreon supporters Everybody and welcome to another edition of In Pit Lane. Well, it's that time of the year again. Yes, the entire world is looking at Grand Prix City, Melbourne, because coming up this weekend, in fact, tomorrow, you can go out to Calder Park for Fast Friday, off-street drag racing action and roll racing. Yes, it's going to be... The whole world is going to be there. Everybody's going to be watching. It's going to be huge. If you don't happen to get out to Calder Park on Friday, I understand there's something happening at Albert Park somewhere down South Melbourne way. It's called the Australian Formula One Grand Prix. And it's apparently you know, quite popular as well. Um, somebody who will be there because he's working there and he has absolutely no choice is my co-host, <laughs> Mr Craig, Doc Gladigo. Doc, welcome. Uh, oh, thank you very much, Brett. Welcome yourself. Well, hello, viewers. Uh, I will be working then there in disguise, incognito, but uh, it's all worth it. And I just saw a little bit of, a, a bit of info this week, the Australian Grand Prix, Brett, did you know, is the most popular Grand Prix in the world. It is, I mean, it's, it's sold out Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's going to be the most attended and it is raved in view. But um, might catch you at the Flower Show instead at the Royal Exhibition Buildings. Yeah, I, I, the Flower Show is, I, I love the Flower Show. The Flower Show is actually very good. If you haven't been to the Flower Show, um, yeah, take some time. Go out and smell the roses, literally. It's quite fun. Coming up to talk about the Australian Formula One Grand Prix, we're going to be joined by former Australian Formula Two champion, David Bruce. He's going to be joining us a little bit later on in the program. He's a, not just a driver, but also a race car engineer as well. So he's going to tell us all the things that are happening behind the scenes. Also, our music tonight, boy, and I tell you what, you're going to love this tonight. Whoa. Yeah, something very different. And joining us tonight is Anna Morley, and uh, well, I won't give too much away, but you're going to love uh, you're going to love what Anna's doing a little bit later on in the program. It's very very cool. We've uh, we've been through the uh, we've been through the whole lot of rehearsal and all that. Was, yes, we very, have very been cool. in awe all evening waiting for Has Anna to do it to, to impress us stuff. Anyway, we, we're running out of time. Well, let's let's kick off straight away. Let's go to the in pit lane motorsport news. Sounds great. Well, there was no shortage of action at Simmons Plains in Tasmania last weekend, both on and off the track. The TCR final race was thrown into chaos by a late decision to withdraw points from the red flag shortened first race after a protest by Gary Rogers Motorsport. The withdrawal of points then had a direct effect on the grid for the feature race, leaving many drivers and teams angry. While a broad boycott of the race was threatened, in the end, only defending champion Tony D'Alberto withdrew. Dalberto's team, Wall Racing, has appealed the decision. A hearing will be held prior to the next round at Phillip Island. Until then, all results remain provisional. With the politics out of the way, the race itself was an absolute thriller. A controversial end to the weekend in the TCR Australia series. With reigning champion Tony Dalberto sitting out the race in protest... British driver Tom Oliphant secured his maiden TCR feature race win and round victory. Starting from second place behind race two winner Dylan O'Keefe, Oliphant grabbed the lead in the final race after some fraught close pack racing early on, maintaining it to the chequered flag, with Clay Richards in his best TCR result driving back through the field for a strong second place. O'Keefe's win in the reverse grid race and third in the final gave him second place overall for the round behind Oliphant. Well, the move, you know, I've been talking to this team for a couple of years now. It was a consideration for, for last year. Um, and it just so happened that everything kind of aligned. And, you know, they're nice and local to me, based out of Campbelltown and I'm in Wollongong. So I think that was a big angle. And obviously, being the most successful team in the championship, um, you know, the hatch, the I-30N was just such a brilliant car that, one I definitely wanted to drive. Uh, so the reason I moved over here was because of my now wife. Uh, we got married last year, but we moved over here a couple of years ago because of her job. Um, 
she's Australian, so it was always on my cards. And to be quite fair, for the entire time we've been in a relationship, which has been just over 14 years now, um, we knew we were always going to come here at some point. We were meant to be here a little earlier, um, but COVID put a, a little pause on that. So the positive news for that is it gave me a couple more years racing for BMW and British Touring Cars, which are some of my fondest memories. But now we moved here, you know, I'm loving life. The sun obviously is a massive improvement on England. And, um, you know, the racing here, although very different, um, there's lots more potential, I feel, because, you know, Australia is its own entity, whereas in England, you get swallowed up by, by Europe a little bit. So um, it's really exciting and I think it's only going to grow. Currently, I'm enjoying my TCR experience and I think it's giving me a great excuse to learn my tracks and, and learn the industry. It's very different over here to England, so um, I'm kind of starting from scratch. Um, also, being with HMO and Hyundai gives me a great local angle to build some sponsorship and, and get some big brands behind me so that you know we can create some exciting opportunities moving forward. I'll never say no to any opportunity. I, you know, throughout my career, I've, I've raced a bit of everything from GTs through to uh, Porsche, through to touring cars. and you know, I'd love to do GT3 again and, you know, I'd love to race a supercar at some point. But, you know, whether those opportunities come up or not, we'll have to wait and see at the moment. I'm really pleased where I am. Premier supercar driver James Golding secured his first Trans Am round victory at Simmons Plains, taking out both Sunday's races. Golding led the feature race from start to finish, clinching his second win and securing the overall round victory. Behind him, Elliot Barber continued his great form to finish second. Race one winner Jordan Boys reclaimed third place, with Todd Hazelwood finishing fourth ahead of reigning champion James Moffat. And Peter Ingram in his very mean-looking RX7 sports sedan dominated the events, claiming victories in all three races and securing the only clean sweep of the weekend. Despite multiple safety car periods bringing the field together, Ingram comfortably maintained his lead throughout all the races. Jeff Torton in the Mark Cars Mustang and local driver Kim Barwick in his R32 Nissan filled the minor placings. Uh, easily the best TCR race I've seen in Australia in the modern era, Brett, there. Uh, fantastic weekend there at Simmons Plains. Cars and drivers are ready for this weekend's Australian Formula One Grand Prix at Albert Park. Max Verstappen has comfortably won the first two races of the season and there seems to be little to indicate a major change. The race could well be a crucial one though in the comeback of Aussie favourite Daniel Ricciardo. After a disappointing opening two rounds, the West Australian is under real pressure to perform, notably by Red Bull reserve driver Liam Lawson. Well, he's been around for a little while now. The Kiwi impressed everyone in his fill-in drives last season and Lawson himself has said the Aussie needs to step it up if he's to stay in F1. A bit controversial there. Red Bull's doctor, Helmut Marco, is believed to have favoured putting Lawson in the car this year. But Christian Horno pushed back hard for Ricardo instead. But another poor performance by the popular Aussie might just force Horner to reassess his position. And you're watching In Pit Lane. When we come back, we'll be previewing this weekend's Australian Formula One Grand Prix and music by our special guest, Anna Morley. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Get the phone ringing for your business with website development and SEO services from Online Invent. Visit onlineinvent.com.au. I want to thank you once again to our sponsor, Online Invent, for keeping In Pit Lane on the air. As we said, um, despite we do get, you know, obviously great support from RMI TV Student Television in terms of getting access to this amazing studio and also our airtime on Channel 31. But the fact is, it still costs a lot of money to produce this program every week. There's uh, there's catering, there's equipment, there's travel and accommodation. It really does uh, add up very very quickly. And without the uh, support of people like Roy and Online Invent, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be here every week. Also, as I've said before, if you're looking to uh, to get a, a website design, uh, something involved in S S SEO or, or web marketing, contact Roy at Online Invent. As I've said before, it's amazing. And I had this just the just the other day, actually, um, trying to get some accreditation for a, for a major, uh, major race series, major international race series. 
and none of the forms worked. I went to put in Australia. Australia wasn't there. I, I typed in Australia and I went, there is no such country. So there's that. We don't exist. We don't exist, apparently. Oh, jeez. Uh, and it wasn't an American The rest of the world needs either. to catch up with us, I think. So anyway, it was a, it was a big problem. So if you're, uh, if you're putting together a website for your company or for your race team or anything like that, call Roy at Online Invent and uh, he can help put, you, put together a great, uh, great website for you and, and, and solve your problems. And not only does he put it all together for you, his ongoing support. So he, his, his follow-up support, his ongoing support, everything he does behind the scenes, he keeps on going and keeps reaching new heights on it. And first of all, if you've already got something already on the cards and already going, well, contact him anyway because he'll uplift it. Yeah, that's it. So thank you once again to Roy Ellery and Online Invent for their support of In Pit Lane and RMITV Student Television. Now, a bonus for you watching at home. Our oh. guest tonight, our music guest is Anna Morley. If you're uh, watching us live on the Facebook uh, behind the scenes, she's playing tomorrow night and next Wednesday night at the Ringo Bar in Brunswick at 8pm. You're also able to find her at Anna Morley Music on Instagram. She's on Spotify. She's on Facebook. But tonight you're going to love this. She's playing uh, playing our break with Dream Distillation. Ladies and gentlemen, Anna Morley.
Welcome back to In Pit Lane. Well, of course, coming up this weekend at uh, Albert Park, of course, is the Australian Formula One Grand Prix. Also, we'll see Formula Two and Formula Three international categories for the second year running as well. Of course, the, uh, we had uh, Dylan O'Keefe with us last week in the Carrera Cup and uh, the supercars running as well. But uh, to join us tonight to, uh, to talk about the, uh, what we're going to see at Albert Park on the weekend and to give his, uh, his, his feedback as both, uh, as both an open-wheel driver but also an engineer as well is the, uh, is the 1998 Australian Formula 2 champion. He is David Bruce. David, welcome to In Pit Lane. Thank you very much. Now tell us. I mean, for, let's start with the let's start with the technical thing. I mean, we've had two rounds already. Um, you've been watching fairly fairly closely. I, I would understand. In terms of what you've seen, both the good and the bad so far. I mean, what what have what stood out for you in terms of the new designs for this year and how the cars are going? The small evolution. There's no large radical changes going on. No one's sort of come with all new different side pods and that kind of stuff. There's tweaks, there's changes, there's differences in the air inlet positions and that kind of stuff. But the cars, if you're at a distance, you wouldn't really know that they've changed a lot. It's all in the detail. So they're, they're getting close to the limit of the rules. They're starting to perfect the game. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're talking about the rule changes coming up in a couple of years' time, because I think we, we do see that in Formula One, don't we? We do get to sort of, you know, maximum efficiency, and then you've got to sort of change the rules up a bit to yep. give everybody a new challenge, because there's only so far they can go, and then the, the, they are very, very tiny little, yes. little rules. Uh, obviously, this weekend, everybody is saying, you know, can Max Verstappen be beaten? Uh, can he? And why, why is he and, and Red Bull, why are they just so dominant? It's, with all of these things, it comes down to the team. The team build the car, they design it, they build it, and obviously someone's got to drive it. And at the moment, they're doing the best job. Um, it's their race to lose. I don't think anybody's going to beat them on a fair one-on-one -on -one run. So if they don't muck up, yeah, Max is going to win. But the real challenge is, okay, how much have the others improved? It's now a very close midfield. If you look at the qualifying in the last two races, 0.1 of a second would move you up five places, no problem at all. So you've got basically um, Red Bull, Ferrari, the rest, and then Alpine. And in that rest, mm. it's about 0.1 of a second from one end to the other. So you're saying that sort of, you know, Ferrari is, is the definite number two and they've just got that little gap on the, on the McLarens and those, and those other teams as well? In the last two races, yes. Don't want to flog a dead horse, but what do you reckon Alp Alpine have really done wrong this year? Like they had a competitive car last year to a certain extent. Um, there's two drivers that are pulling their hair out, the French hair out at the moment. But what do you think, what the, could they have radically done wrong to go into the season to, to upset their apple cart? As I said before, it's really about the team because they designed the car and they've imploded. They're losing people left, right and centre. Their senior technical people are moving, moving out. Um, there's all sorts of turmoil going on in the place. And while that's going on, it's very hard to come up with a car that's competitive when the field is so close together. So until they sort out the team, they're not going to really... They've also got the problem is that the team's spread all over the place. I mean, you've got sort of, you know, management in France and the cars are being built in England and the engines are being built in France. Everything's all over the place, isn't it? I mean, how important is it to get, you know, get everything into one spot and uh, so that everybody's, you know, speaking the same language? These days, it's probably not as important as it used to be. Everything's online. You can Zoom, you can transfer CAD files, that kind of stuff. But it does help to sit down and talk face to face with people. Quick question: You have got obviously you've got the background in your uh, work life as well, though. Too is Adrian Newey a genius? Um, he's certainly very good. Um, I don't think he deserves the accolades he gets sometimes. That's because to, to completely redesign a car and within a couple of years turn it around so quickly to something that's only second or third fastest, he just seems to have a knack for regenerating it so quickly. He does. He, he's old school. He uses a pencil and paper and a drawing board and stuff. But he understands. One of the, the advantages of doing the calculations by hand or the drawings by hand and stuff is you have to understand what's going on. So he's old school. He understands it. They've been through Venturi floors and stuff before. So he's been down this road before. He's been around so long. He can definitely steer his team to come up with the results. And that helps. It's, it's no one man does the whole job. There's 200 odd people in the engineering department alone that come up with these cars. But someone giving them some guidance just to say, no, don't go down that road, go down this road, makes a world of difference. And I think that's what Adrian does. Mm. Obviously, this weekend, uh, the, in terms of the, the public, I mean, outside of, you know, the, the battle for the lead, the, the, the people that, you know, most, 
most of the the, the, the the locals will be looking at are, of course, Oscar Piastri and Daniel Ricciardo. Let's start with Daniel, first of all. I mean, you know, like it looked like his Formula One career was over. He's been thrown on the lifeline with um, the, the, the team formerly known as Alpha Tauri. Um, but he hasn't performed terribly well in the first two two races, and he is now under he's now under pressure. As we said in the news, there is certainly sort of a, a lot of uh, a lot of talk behind the scenes now. With all of the Red Bull sort of turmoil and all that, the people are starting to say, you know, like you're running out of excuses now, son. I mean, you, you you've got to you, you've got to start performing. How much pressure is he actually under? Only he can answer that one. But there is obviously a lot of pressure. Um, to his credit, last year, the two times when he got in the car, both cars moved up the field. So he's providing that experience in helping to set the car up on the weekend for the track and the weather of the day. And he was always very valued for that. I mean, I know the McLaren guys said that, you know, like he, what they really, the, one of the things they were going to miss apart from his, you know, great personality and all the rest of it was the fact they said he really gave us very, very good feedback in testing and, and, and in the simulator as well. Yes, so sticking two new people in the car, they'd lose that. And as I said before, the whole midfield is 0.1 of a second. If he was 0.1 of a second quicker, he would be five places up the grid. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very close. And all they've got to do is a small improvement compared to the rest of the field, and they'll be up. But it's very hard. It's very tight. A mistake, and of course, they're way down the back as well. So. Daniel's input's always been extremely valuable, hasn't as well, though, too. And Yuki just doesn't seem to be quite mature enough, I think, to be able to give that... Uh, give that They've got the problem, though, that they do have Lawson. And Liam Lawson is obviously a great talent. I mean, there's no doubt he proved that last year. He's obviously... You know, and as we saw with uh, with Oscar Behrman just recently, I mean, there's, there's so much talent waiting yes. in the wings, ready, ready to go. What about, speaking of new young talent, Oscar Piastri, literally the hometown boy... Um, what are you, what, what is your impression of, of how he's doing at the moment? He's done a good job. A, a good job in Formula One is you get in the car, you finish races and you don't crash it. Um, and that's what he's done. He's, he's been close to his teammates' times. He's been consistent. He's got good feedback. He's learning as he goes. He's actually said in interviews that his big failure last year, and you can see it in his, um, his runs, they did go out too hard, trying to get the good times and being competitive with people, destroy his tyres and work his way back down the field each stint. He's aware of that now, he's looking at it, and he certainly in the last two races has worked at pacing himself to manage the tyres and finish well. So he's, everything's looking good for him. Those upgrades really helped McLaren throughout the season. They, they found something there finally. And I, th I think, uh, think things would have been on the rocks a little bit more for, uh, for old Zach Brown if things hadn't turned around as quickly as they did. So the upgrade certainly worked. A little bit about yourself, though, as well, too, David. Um, you competed back in the Formula 2s back in the, in the 90s. And yep. do you, how hard do you think it would be today to do what you did back then? Is it, is it, is it a, a, a bad concept that you couldn't get your head around now? No, I think you could do it in Australia. Um, it gets getting harder and harder overseas because they've got more and more controlled formulas. Um, it used to be Formula Ford was one of the stepping stones in England and then into Formula 3, and they weren't fixed chassis classes, so you could fiddle with your cars, which means engineers like myself can learn what parameters you can change in the car to change what aspects of the cornering and the performance of the car. Now you've got controlled cars, OK, you can do tyre pressures and things, but you can't really learn about roll centres and chassis stiffness and all those kind of things. Just quickly, we need to wrap up, but... Uh, up. It's pretty obvious that Max, but who's the outsider? I mean, if you're having sort of, you know, a Bob each way for as an outsider, who do you think can possibly beat Max on the weekend? Well, if Max falls off the track for some reason, um, <laughs> which is a long shot, um, obviously you've got his teammate Perez, who's come second the last two races, so he would be the next one to, you'd have to beat. But you've got a, a bunch of them. Alonso is always a bit of a, a wild card, um, and they're doing well. They're at the front of the, the pack in the last two races. And of course you've got the two Ferraris who are definitely got some speed in them. Um, and if they can get their act together and, and not mismanage the race, they're also a good contender. Carlos seems to be an angry man right now. Yeah, so that, that's true. Hey, listen, uh, thanks for thanks for coming in and uh, giving us your your insight into into that because uh, you know I mean everybody will go out on the weekend and the, the, it all looks the same, but you don't know when you somebody's actually built cars and run race teams and the rest. It really does help to get that insight. Thanks a lot for coming in and for now, David Bruce. Thanks for joining us in pit lane. Thank you very much. And we're going to take a break now. When we come back, we're going to take you over to Adelaide for the Adelaide Motorsport Festival and to take us out tonight, some fabulous music from our guest, Anna Morley. Don't go away. We'll be right back. 
your business. Okay, thank you. That one doesn't and SEO services from Online Invent. Visit onlineinvent.com.au. There's content for as well too. A little project. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Once again, Julian, before we uh, before we wrap the the program up, we've got David here, and you've got you want yeah, to answer some questions? Ch- was, uh, yeah, I've got a couple. Of, yeah. Well, one big question. I was chatting to uh, David. David Bruce has joined us here this evening. So for you, you uh, online viewers, who get the bonus content right now and have a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. Well, it's a little bit more uh, nitty gritty tonight. David's here, and uh, he's 30, 37 years, I think, in the as at, at Ford as an engineer as well too, and product development, etc. You've got a little project on the side coming up uh, you've been working on for a while called Blue Thunder. Tell me a bit about it, please. It's, um, it's styled a little bit like a, an old 40s sports car, but it's... Hot rod, obviously, uh, with you know, big wheels and that kind of stuff. Yeah. has a supercharged V8 in the front of the thing, weighs about 900 kilograms. Um, Nothing. It's three times the sniff that's required for being road registered. It will be road registered. I've had to comply with all the relevant ADRs for an individually constructed vehicle. Um, basically, now I'm retired from Ford... Um, I'm making a car for myself rather than for Ford for once. Right, so that, you can put it in the handbook as, a, as, as another car that's been made in Australia since all the big guns have shut down. There's two or three, you know, it, there's the Brabham, I think there's the Bowl, we're trying to still create a couple of cars here, there. And, Is that uh, an area that we could get? Because, you know, you mentioned a couple of iconic, you know, brands there that, that were around. Um, our mate George Vitovic had the Python, which is yeah. a Cobra replica, yep. uh, which was very successful. And, and George, you know, on, on this show and in, in private conversations as well, was saying how desperately hard it was to build these cars because mm-hmm. of all the regulations, all of the, you know, the ADRs and, and the compliance that was, was required. Um, so how hard, how difficult is it to, to come up with something, you know, totally bespoke something from the ground up and actually get it out onto the road and have it road registered? Put your dream it's, on wheels. Yeah, it's, I'm a little bit different coming from an engineering point of view. I'm one of the people who do all the calculations by hand and all the drawings, both the pencil and paper and that kind of stuff. So the design of the car was easy, relatively speaking. To a lot of people, that's hard. They're looking for help to make cars that are you know, going to meet the requirements of the ADRs and to handle properly and that kind of to stuff. feel like a car. Yeah, and not have some horrible curse or whatever in the thing that scares the difference out of anybody driving the thing. Mm. That's the easy bit for me. The difficult bit for me was actually making all the parts. Um, I've never made full-size fiberglass bodies before. Um, so making plugs, moulds, bodies and things, getting caught with resins going off, that kind of stuff. Um, generally, that was always when I was at Ford. That was made by somebody else. Now, I really started to fully appreciate why it took them so long to do it. <laughs> but, clay moulding? You didn't do it with clay, but yeah. But, no, but I mean, they anything, did, they, but yeah. Oh, yeah, they, 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 they do they, clays they and then take splashes off them. And, weeks and years on those. Well, the car things. that you, uh, you drove to a Formula 2 championship was a Reynard, but, I mean, you made a lot of modifications to it. And that's one of the things, I mean, if you were doing it nowadays, I've often said, you know, like, we had the Australian special in the, in, in the old days where... Yeah, you, know, you would take something like an MGTC and stick a hold and engine into it, or, or you know, the most fam- one of the most famous, then later, you know, it, it, illustrations with Brock taking an Austin A40 and sticking a hold and into it. You, you don't really get the opportunity to do that as much nowadays. I mean, in terms of you getting in, back into motors, if you were a young guy now, I mean, what category would you look at to, to be able to, you know, make your sort of automotive expression and, and, and get actually involved in the design and building and improvement of a race car? That's a very good question, and I honestly don't have a good answer for you. Um, Formula Ford's now only historics, so, and fortunately historics, you can't obviously change the car to update it. You, you meant to keep it in the old form. Um, there's very few easy... The, the advantage of Formula Ford was a space frame, and it's very easy to change them, chop them around and learn what the changes do. Uh, when you start talking aluminium tubs or even worse, carbon fibre tubs, very hard to change and to start figuring out what effects your changes are making. So it's, it's quite difficult. I mean, there's obviously still Formula 3 running um, and there's other categories, of Formula S5000, that kind of stuff. But S5000 is a fixed chassis, so you can't mess with it. Um, the Formula 3, of course, are all carbon fibre chassis from England. They're very difficult to mess with. Um, so it, it's difficult to to do what I've done and to learn what I learned doing it that way. So many rules and regulations now, all things that have to be status quo. You always had to work around the rules. Um, that's, that's not the problem. The problem is the freedom in the car, if you like. Mm. Um, having the freedom the build. in the rules to allow people to come up with their own cars mm. to see if they can get an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. 
Welcome back to In Pit Lane. Well, we mentioned Liam Lawson before. He was just one of a number of high-profile motorsport identities in Adelaide last weekend for the annual Adelaide Motorsport Festival. It's an event that's rapidly becoming the Goodwood Festival of the Southern Hemisphere. There was no shortage of stars on hand, but it was the cars that uh, took the spotlight, as you'll see as we take you onto the streets of Adelaide for some of these highlights. And now for something completely different. Tonight playing us out is Anna Morley. You can find her at Anna Morley Music on Instagram. She's on Spotify. She's on Facebook. And you'll be able to catch her playing live at the Ringo Bar in Brunswick at 8pm next Wednesday. So to take us out tonight, something you're going to love this, this is Anna Morley with After All. Good night.
Thank you.